I'm now going to welcome to the stage our final bravada of the evening, uh, Ken Barker, otherwise known as Lord Barker of Bulbahai, is going to talk to us about Lordy Lordy. after a short illness. He'd inherited his title and the 10,000 acre in Audley estate in Angus when he was four years old. After Eton, Christchurch and the Scots Guard, he spent nearly 47 years in the Lords, serving as a Conservative minister from 1979 to 1989. He never married and his title died with him. But under the Byzantine rules drawn up when the majority of hereditary peers were excluded from the Lords in 1999, his seat was contested in a by-election in which 27 hereditary peers stood. And we thought we got rid of the hereditary peerage. Now then, the, minute, the winner of that uh, uh, contest was this man, Alistair Colin Leakey Campbell. Leakey, Leakey. Fourth Baron Colgrave. Eton, Cambridge, High Sheriff of Kent, etc., etc., and of course, Conservative. <laughs> and you thought the hereditary aspect of the House of Lords was dead? Not a bit of it. One dies, and 20 or 30 are queuing up <laughs> to take their place. <laughs> now then, uh, it's a little bit of a quiet in this evening, so I think we'd like a little sing along. So please uh, do sing to this. <laughs> Sullivan Ilanthe uh, from uh, what was it, 18, uh, to 18, uh, well, anyway, to 1882. And uh, frankly, very little seems to have changed about the, uh, the House of Lords from the time that W.S. Gilbert was, uh, was lampooning it. The problem is that uh, uh, you might say, so what? You might say uh, there are more important things to worry about than the House of Lords, and indeed, there well, maybe. But I'm hoping to persuade you that the wholly unelected upper chamber uh, in Parliament is a rubbish system and an affront to our democracy. It's going to be an easy one then, isn't it? <laughs> now what do I care? Well, I spent part of my career here in the press gallery of the House of Lords, looking out over the uh, red leather benches and listening to the uh, and uh, listening to and reporting on the activities of their lordships. My conclusion was that by a camera, let's say, two-chamber uh, legislature, was in basically a good thing. If you only have one chamber, you have the danger of an elected dictatorship uh, uh, pushing through their own partisan uh, legislation and views uh, at will. If you have a second revising chamber, they can at least uh, stop it or, 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 or hold it up. At the very least, they can indeed revise the law. Well, my second conclusion was that Britain's bicameral system was basically crap, uh, because the people in the second chamber were completely unrepresentative of the country and had no democratic accountability whatsoever. Okay, time for a very quick uh, history lesson. 
Uh, the House of Lords goes back to before the Norman Conquest, the Saxon monarchs established a, an advisory chamber made up of uh, the, the great and the good, landowners, church leaders, known for some reason as the Assembly of the Wise. Um, the, uh, Henry II, Henry III, um, uh, took, took a back, the Assembly took a back seat after the Norman Conquest, uh, but when Henry III ran out of money, he summoned a great council of knights from the Shire. Did they pay him any money? No. So he then had to uh, go to the citizens of uh, each uh, city and, and borough, and uh, the great council now had two distinct uh, sides to it. It had the lords and it had the commons. Well, uh, in the 14th century, uh, Edward III, the council split into the two assemblies we recognise today. And for 500 years, unelected peers have been making laws on behalf of us, the British people. Things began to change a bit uh, when uh, the start of the last century, when Lloyd George couldn't get his 1909 People's Budget through the uh, Commons because of the Conservative uh, inbuilt majority, the Liberals decided on reform. So what did they do? Abolish the military system? Create an elected chamber? Not a bit of it. They simply made it uh, possible for the Lords only to delay legislation rather than to veto it, and that was for just a year. But you still had a revising chamber, comprised entirely of hereditary peers, plus the old bishop and law lord. Now, amazingly, it was the Conservative government under Super Mac Macmillan that made the most radical change uh, by introducing life peers in the 1960s. But they were still heavily outnumbered by the hereditaries. Every Labour government uh, since has tried and pretty much failed to reform the Lords. Tony Blair had a go at getting rid of the hereditary uh, 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 element did a reasonably good job, except he left 92 behind. 92 were in three peers. Why? What on earth? What? How could he got to that number? What on earth did he put there? And they're self-perpetuating because, as we've seen, that they simply elect a new hereditary peer to be one of the 92 when one of them dies. So nothing changes there. So now we've got a complete uh, mismatch. Um, that, sorry, they, in 2008, a Commons vote making me back to wholly elected upper chamber. A Commons vote backed a wholly elected upper chamber. A week later, the Lords responded by backing a wholly appointed one, and Labour simply dropped the whole thing. More recently, Conservative backbenchers actually voted against the government, uh, their own government's reform bill, so that too was abandoned. So basically, nothing has happened. So now we've got a complete mismatch of hereditary and life peers in the upper chamber, which gets bigger and bigger just as the Commons gets smaller and smaller through boundary changes. We have the biggest second chamber in the world, something to be proud of, except for China. Well, they've got rather more people in China, so it's perhaps reasonable they should have a bigger upper chamber. Year by year it gets worse, more and more peers are appointed by political patronage, cronyism, hefty pay uh, payments to party profit. <coughs> yes, in Britain today, you can virtually buy yourself a peerage and seat in the House of Lords. Uh, an exhaustive study by Oxford Academics Three years ago, statistically proved a direct relationship between donations to political parties and nominations to the peerage. So, the Great Reform Bill of 1832 may have uh, done away with rotten boroughs and given the franchise to pop wallopers, but that was only the Commons. It did nothing at all for the for the Lords. Uh, today, in the 21st century, the Prime Minister and Leader of the Opposition uh, appoint all members of the Upper Chamber, often on the basis, as we've seen, of how much money they can pay to party coffers. It's a scandal. And it's one that nobody seems to care very much about. Of course, once you've got your life period, you can start to recoup your investment. Simply by turning up, you can earn £305 a day, attendance allowance, plus travel expenses, and a subsidised restaurant and bar facilities. In fact, the overall bill for the unelected upper chamber in the last financial year, excluding building costs, stood at £68 million. The average cost of the British taxpayer, that's you and me, of a single peer in the House of Lords is £83,000 a year. So, in the 2016-2017 parliamentary session, 109 peers failed to speak even once in the chamber, but still claimed expenses totaling just under a million pounds. Actually, I don't really care how much it costs. If they were effective, if they were doing their job, the money wouldn't be the point. But the point is they're not doing any decent job at all. It simply doesn't work. There are always more Tories than Labour peers, and the composition of the Lords in no way reflects how the people vote in general elections. Now, this is a terrible um, uh, slide. I don't expect anybody to understand a word of it. But if you look at it, <laughs> 
Labour have 40% of the seats in the Commons, but only 25% in the Lords. 40% of the Commons, 25% in the Lords. The SNP have 5.4% of seats in the Commons, none in the Lords. The Lib Dems have less than 2% of seats in the Commons, but 13% in the Upper Chamber. There's absolutely no logic to it whatsoever. Clearly, what is needed is a properly elected Upper Chamber that reflects the popular vote at a general election. That's to say, the number of votes cast for, a, for any one party. Okay. In 2017, this was how the popular vote was cast. Conservatives 42%, Labour 40, Lib Dem 7.4, SNP 3, Green 1.6. Now look at how many common seats the first past the post got them. Um, 318 for the Tories and 262 for Labour. So, 42% of the vote gets the Tories 48% of the seats, Labour gets only 2% fewer uh, votes, but 8% fewer seats. So, the first past the vote system, for whatever its merits, has some serious problems in terms of the popular vote. Okay, it's a bit technical, a bit confusing, but the basic point is it's not fair. Now, here's a list of people whose votes were effectively uh, wasted in the last in elections over the last 40 years. In only one election, has the majority of the electorate got the government they voted for. One election in 40 years. In the last two elections, very nearly two-thirds of voters effectively wasted their vote by voting for a party that didn't become government. So whatever advantages, again, our constituency-based system might have, popularly elected government is not among them, but we can solve this at a stroke. You simply elect the House of Lords on a popular vote cast at the general election. Now, after last year's poll, the elected upper chamber would have been made up of Conservatives 42%, Labour 40%, Lib Dem 7.4%, SMB 3.9%, etc. You still have your lower chamber, you still uh, have the Commons elected as it's always been, but now your upper chamber, the Lords or the Senate, whatever else you want to call it, is elected by proportional representation of the popular vote. Okay, but who chooses who gets elected? Well, that's simple. It's the basis of a party list. So, there are, say there are just 100 members of the House of Lords, each party puts forward 100 names, the first 42 on the Conservatives' list are elected, the first 40 on Labour's list, the first 7 on the Lib Dems, etc. So, this means that the party leaders can still determine who they want to sit in the upper chamber, they can still propose trade unionists, or their banking cronies, or uh, they can even have law lords, or they can have the bishops if they really want them. Um, okay, I can already hear you complaining. Uh, what about cross benches? Those with no particular party loyalty who vote according to their conscience, aren't they one of the great strengths of the current House of Lords, of the current system? Well, yes, to an extent they are. But here's a really radical idea. Why not um, allow all moles, that's members of the House of Lords, allow all moles to vote according to their conscience? Abolish the whips. Have secret voting. So they would be genuinely putting country before party on every big issue. Ah, talking about big issue. Um, my proposal would finally put pay to the regulatory peers. They would be out on their ear, out on the street, and have nowhere to go except for their stately homes and heart leads. But it's not all roses. I can see one major downside to constitutional reform. Once we've established that we're actually a democracy, and that our parliament is fully elected, and that the majority of our lawmakers are not there because of an accident of birth, or because of a political patronage, once we've moved into the 21st, or even the 20th century, then how on earth are we going to justify an unelected head of state who's only there because of an accident of birth? In the words of the popular ditty, God save the Queen. <laughs> Great, so any questions for Kent? Anyone want to, uh, to jump in and reform slash uh, remove the laws immediately? Do I see any questions? Yeah. Yes, and when you go back and pass you the microphone. Yeah. Um, just, 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 just. Thanks very much. Um, you failed to mention the Greens and UKIP. Well, what about them? 
there, there, there is a slight problem with democracy, of course, that um, if you uh, allow uh, the popular vote to determine who's going to sit in your legislature, you will possibly get the odd member of the BNP or member of UKIP, uh, just as you will get some, some good guys like, like the Greens. Um, I mean, that's sort of manageable, isn't it? I mean, is, is, it, is it really so awful if, if there is a number of people in the country that actually are voting for these guys, shouldn't they have some representation in Parliament? I mean, it's very convenient that the first past the post means that they don't, but is that really fair? And as I say, if you lose what you lose on them having the right wing, uh, you possibly gain by having the left wing or the radical or the, 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 the ecologist. Uh, so you're for proportional representation? Oh, absolutely, for the House of Lords, completely. And how, uh, that, that, that's what this is argument is about. Proportional representation based on the popular vote at an election. So you go to an election, uh, you, the, 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 you take the total number of votes that are cast, you divide them up according to the parties, and then you elect the Lords based on that, on, on that basis. What about the skills that? What about sorry, what about the skills that we get by people who aren't? Uh, uh, yeah, we, but, but you can get those in exactly the same way. The the, the party leaders draw up this list of say the first hundred people they want. They put the skills that they want to see in there. You can have the scientists. You can have your military people. You can have whoever you like on the list. And if, if you happen to get you know 100 percent of the popular vote, all hundred of your people get elected. You won't, you'll get around 40, between 40 and 60, and so you get 40 or 60 seats if you're one of the two major parties. But it will mean that the smaller parties get more representation uh, in, in, in the Commons, and you won't have this absurd situation where the Lib Dems you know, have, have 5 4% of the, of the Commons vote, or 8% of the Commons vote, and 15% of the, of the Lords. Question, question here. Thank you. Yeah, but didn't the Parliament Act um, reform the Lords? Uh, in that the Commons can ultimately override the rules using the Parliament Act. Yeah, uh, it, 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 they could not ultimately do it. It takes two years uh, to do. Um, they very seldom do it on finance bills, although that's, that's possible. Um, uh, I mean, I'm not asking for that to change. The, the argument against the reform of the House of Lords is generally that it would give too much um, uh, weight, too much authority, too much legitimacy to the upper house. Uh, and then um, they would start to want to, to, to make reforms and change things. I, I'm not suggesting that. I'm suggesting we leave the, the, the system exactly as it is at the moment. So that the, uh, the lower house, the commons, are elected by proportional deputation with, on a constituency basis, for good or for evil. I mean, you can argue that all you like, but let's leave that alone. Let's leave the, the uh, powers of the House of Lords as they are at the moment, relatively minor. They're a reforming house, they're, they're, they're a you know, revi revising house, uh, and See how we go. You can change it later, but let's for the moment leave it, leave it where it is. Thank you. Any any final questions? Any, uh, any final questions for Ken? Uh, oh, yeah, one final question at the back, and then we will uh, call it night. Um, <clears throat> if you got your way, what would the main benefit be? Well, I think it would be democracy, uh, in, 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 you know, which is obviously. An interesting concept, anyway, but um, I think, I think it, it, it would be slightly different at this. It would be more democratic than it is at the moment. Uh, I think the I think that the uh, more radical suggestion I've made that the stuff about the party list and the proportional representation is not terribly radical. The radical thing would be to abolish the whips and have secret votes. That would make a huge difference because then people would vote according to their conscience on any issue, and you wouldn't be certain what was going to happen. Given that you can only delay bills for, for two years and not, not, not uh, uh, vote them out completely, it wouldn't necessarily matter. It, the lower house would have, might have to wait. But it would be, a, I think, a really good thing for people to be able to vote, uh, you know, not be held accountable to the whips and not be thrown out at the next election if they don't, or, or have, the, have the, their jobs removed as, as, as ministers or the payroll voters, as it's called. Uh, I think that would be a, a major change. Again, I'm not saying I agree for the Commons. I think that system has been going for ages. It seems to work relatively well, you can argue, you know, here and there. But let's reform the upper house because that is a complete mess and nobody seems to be prepared to touch it. Excellent. Right. Well, on that note, uh, um, can we thank Kent for a wonderful talk?